<laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, are we, are we live with the mic? Okay, great. Okay, now, uh, how many of you, would everybody who is part of the debate team here at Shadyside raise their hand? What, is there, is there no debate team here? <laughs> okay, the reason I ask is, when I was in high school in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, Shady Side was always our most terrifying opponent. <laughs> and I really think that my training in debate was one of the, uh, the important things in my, uh, in my career as a scientist, because learning how to speak is an important part of spreading your, your scientific knowledge. But let's get going. Uh, here we are. We're going to talk about time, Einstein, and the coolest stuff in the universe. And the thing I want to point out is where I'm from. I'm from uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, an agency of the U.S. government that uh, provides the standards of measurements. I'm also from the University of Maryland, and I'm part of the laser cooling and trapping group. And these people, Gretchen Campbell, Paul Lett, Trey Porto, and Ian Spielman, are my uh, colleagues, and of course we have to thank the people who give us money, so there's the people who give us money. And uh, I want to emphasize, we're going to have fun today, okay? So, uh, so, so, so now you may ask, okay, what does time have to do with Einstein? And uh, the answer is that time put Einstein on the cover of their magazine uh, as the person of the century. And uh, uh, it was a great choice because uh, Einstein changed the way we think about our physical world in so many ways. And each one of these things that I'm showing you here, can we take the lights down a little bit? Uh, super. So each one of these things I'm showing you here would, would be worth a one hour lecture, but we don't even have an hour here. But probably the thing he's most known for is the theory of special relativity, the theory that tells us that space and time are relative to who is looking at them. Before Einstein, people thought that space and time were like a fixed stage on which the events of the universe played themselves out, like this stage. But Einstein told us that wasn't true, that the stage was actually part of the action. And he came to that conclusion by asking himself a question that I think people have been asking themselves since the beginning of human time, what is time? What is this strange thing that is always in the present but will soon become the past? Why is tomorrow always one day away? Uh, people have been asking themselves questions like that since the beginning of human time. And what Einstein gave as an answer may strike you as being a bit superficial. He said, time is what a clock measures. But by taking that idea seriously, he came up with his ideas about the relativity of time. But if time is what a clock measures, you may ask, what is a clock? Well, a clock for me is something that ticks. The earliest clock is the rotating Earth. Now, ancient people did not know that the Earth was rotating, but they saw the sun rise and set every day, and that allowed them to tick off days. As technology increased, uh, People understood that a pendulum swinging back and forth could be a ticker for something like this grandfather's clock that you see right here. Some of you, although probably very few of, though, of you, may be wearing a clock on your wrist. Exactly. Most people just get their time from a cell phone, but I'm old school and I like to look at my, uh, my wristwatch. And this is a calculator watch. It's really retro. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really hard to find a clock like, a watch like this anymore because it's just so retro. But uh, the, the ticker for this clock is a quartz crystal that looks sort of like this. It's in the shape of a tuning fork and it is the ticker for this quartz watch. All these clocks have tickers and all of these tickers are imperfect in one way or another. The best tickers are atoms. Now, why are atoms tickers? It's because Atoms have certain very distinct energy levels, and in order to go from one energy level to another, you shine in radio waves or microwaves or light that is 
electromagnetic fields oscillating at a certain frequency. That frequency is the ticking frequency of the atoms. And so the great thing about atoms is that every atom of the same kind is absolutely identical to every other atom of that kind in the entire universe. We've agreed by international treaty that a certain number of ticks of a cesium atom, cesium-133, a specific isotope of cesium, is going to equal one second. About nine billion ticks of a cesium atom is going to equal one second. And it turns out every cesium atom, as far as we know, in the entire universe is absolutely identical to every other one. So this is great. Every watch is made a little bit differently from every other watch, but every cesium atom is absolutely identical, and so it, they make great clocks. They're also very little affected by things like temperature and humidity and pressure. We keep them in a vacuum. So these really make great tickers. Now you might ask, how good are these clocks? Well, for less than $100, you can buy a quartz watch like this. It costs a lot because it's retro. I mean, you can get a much cheaper watch than this retro one. And it'll be good to about 30 seconds in a year. That's a part in a million. Pretty good for a watch. But if you're willing to pay $100,000, you can buy an atomic clock that is good to a part in a million million or 30 seconds in a million years. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, $100,000 for a clock? Uh, who's gonna pay that? But think about it this way. You pay a thousand times more money and you get a million times better performance. I think that's a bargain. <laughs> but you still may ask, why does anybody need a clock that is that good? Because after all, we don't need to know what time it is to that level of precision in order to go about our daily lives. Or so you may think. So you may think. I now want to convince you that you are very happy that someone is keeping track of time to that level of precision. I found this ad in a magazine once. It says, uh, if you're in our car uh, and you get into trouble, don't worry because help is only 10,000 miles away. And the 10,000 miles they're talking about is the orbiting altitude. Can we turn down a little bit more the, the, the stage lights? The, the orbiting, great, the orbiting altitude of uh, the satellites of the global positioning system, the satellite navigation system. And, uh, and with this satellite navigation system, you can tell where you are anywhere on the face of the Earth to within a few meters, and someone who has access to it can know where you are and come and help you. And that's the idea of this ad. But how does this work? It works because of atomic clocks, the kind that costs $100,000. Except these clocks go up in satellites and they cost a lot more money, because anything that goes in a satellite is going to cost a lot of money. So here's the idea. Here is a cartoon of how the global positioning system works. Here's two of the at least 24 satellites of the global positioning system, and each one of them has several atomic clocks on board. And here you are with your GPS receiver. Now, you don't have a clock in your GPS receiver, but let's just imagine for a moment that you do, just for the sake of argument. And all of these clocks are synchronized, so you see they're all reading the same time. Now, the satellite clocks are broadcasting information about what time it is and also about where they are. Now, they broadcast that information and it takes about a certain amount of time moving at the speed of light for the signal that tells what time it is to get to your receiver. Now, you know that all the clocks are synchronized. You see that your clock reads four you read the signal from this clock, which is itself reading four, but the signal took a little while to get to you, so it reads one. That means you know how far away that satellite is, and you know where it is, so that means you know you're somewhere along here. So now you've got more satellites, of course. So when you look at the other satellite in this cartoon and get the signal from it, it's a different distance away, and now you know that you're somewhere along this curve. And that means you're right here. You can figure out that you're not there. And you know where you are within a few meters, anywhere on the face of the Earth. Now, this would be fine if we lived in a two-dimensional universe, which we don't. We live in a three-dimensional universe. Uh, the screen is two-dimensional. So you need an extra clock. 
so a third satellite. And remember, you don't have a clock yourself, so you need still another satellite that has a clock in it. And when you've got four satellites that you can see, then you can tell where you are. So sometimes when you turn on your GPS, it says searching for satellites. That's what's going on. It's looking for those four satellites. If it finds five or six, so much the better. But it has to have at least four in order to work. And this is used for everything. Uh, I used this to drive from Maryland to Pittsburgh and find my way exactly to the door of the hotel. It was that good. And uh, taxis use it, delivery trucks use it, the military uses it, uh, uh, civilian aircraft use it. Uh, it's part of our daily lives. So atomic clocks are already part of your daily lives. These clocks that are good to a part in a million million, a part in 10 to the 12. Now, how did the, all this get started and what do these clocks look like? Back in 1949, at my agency, it used to be called the National Bureau of Standards, now NIST, this was the first atomic clock in 1949. It was good to a part in 10 to the eighth. By 1993, things had improved a little bit and these clocks are, were good to a part in 10 to the 14, a part in 100 million million. In other words, 100 times better than what you can buy just by having really good people in the lab working really hard, they could make it good to a part in 10 to the 14, a part in 100 million million. But the problem is that making it better than that is really hard because the atoms are moving really fast. The atoms are moving at a couple hundred meters per second and it's hard to measure the ticking of something that's moving at a couple hundred meters per second. Somebody said it's like trying to tell time on a clock that is whizzing past your face at the speed of sound and crashing into the wall. Doesn't sound so easy, but these uh, scientists and engineers have worked really hard to make these clocks work at a part in 10 to the 14. And you might say, a part in 10 to the 14, that's incredible, and it is. Uh, it's, it's the most accurate thing we know how to measure. But we are not satisfied. We want to do better. And in order to do better, we're gonna have to make, have to make the atoms move more slowly. And making the atoms move more slowly means that we're going to have to cool them. Because the difference between hot and cold is the difference between fast and slow. If I have a, uh, a hot gas, like the air in this room, uh, it means that the atoms and molecules are moving around really fast. The nitrogen molecules in the air in this room are moving at about the speed of sound, about 300 meters per second. The, uh, if, if we could cool down the air in this room, what it would mean would be that the atoms and molecules would be moving more slowly. And that's what we want, because if they're moving more slowly, then we will have uh, a chance to measure them better. So let's bring up the stage lights uh, to illustrate to you how uh, cold we would like to make our atoms. I brought along, courtesy of the physics department at the University of Pittsburgh, some really cold stuff. Inside this container is liquid nitrogen. Now nitrogen, as you know, is the major constituent of the air. So this is like liquid air. Compared to this, this entire room is burning hot. Imagine what would happen if you had a red hot stove and you poured cold water onto the red hot stove. It would boil. And that's what's going on here. That's why these seats are blocked off, right? Right, right? <laughs> but let me point something out. When you saw this happen, you recoiled, right? You did too, right? Well, I'm in the splash zone. Yeah, you're in the splash zone. But let me tell you a story. <laughs> a couple days ago, I gave a talk like this at the University of Pittsburgh, and in the front row were a bunch of kids that were probably seven, eight, nine years old. When I poured the liquid nitrogen on the floor, every one of those kids was on the floor, on their hands and knees, to see how wonderful this stuff is. <laughs> this is the whole idea. That, Kids at that age are insatiably curious about everything. And what I want to recommend to you is, don't grow up. <laughs> Keep that childlike curiosity that makes you want to find out what's going on. Sure, learn a little bit of stuff, become a little bit more mature, but never lose that childlike curiosity because that's what 
we want in our scientists is that kind of curiosity, the kind of curiosity that those little kids have and that I'm sure that many of you do as well. Okay. This stuff, this stuff is incredibly cold. And in order to uh, 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 cool down a gas, we might think it's a good idea to uh, refrigerate it using this really cold stuff. So here I have a traditional container for hot gas. I'm from the Washington area. We have plenty of hot air there. And so I understand your school colors are blue and gold, so we got a blue balloon. And so having filled the balloon with hot gas, hot air, we're gonna stuff it into this bucket, which is filled with liquid nitrogen. Now, as I push it down, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of spilling the liquid nitrogen out on the floor. Now, that's just the way it goes, okay? Okay, great. Now, let's see what else we can do to show just how cold this stuff is. Here is what we call a Dewar flask. This is, is basically a thermos bottle, okay? But it's been sitting out uh, in the room all day, all morning, and that means that it is, compared to the liquid nitrogen, this container is burning hot. Imagine what would happen if you took a, um, a metal bucket and heated it up uh, in a fire until the bucket was glowing red. And then if you took some, um, some cold water and poured it into the red hot bucket, what would happen? And what would happen is the water would boil. And that's what's going on here. Okay, the water is boiling. Okay, so let's let that boil away, uh, cooling down the inside of our, uh, 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 of, of our, our flask, and let's, let's cool down some more gas. So now we got a gold balloon. Because, you know, if we want to do experiments with cold atoms, uh, uh, we want to, want to have plenty, so we'll, we'll cool down some more, some more atoms and molecules in the air in this balloon by, by stuffing this one into the liquid nitrogen as well. Okay, great, great, that's wonderful. Okay, great, now let's go back to here. Uh, it's boiled off a little bit, so let's top it up. There we go, okay. So is this exciting enough for you guys in the front row? That's great, okay. Now here we have a nice fresh flower. So the staff here at Shadyside has, has gotten a nice fresh uh, flower for me. This flower has been sitting out at room temperature. So like everything else, compared to the liquid nitrogen, this flower burning is burning hot, exactly. It's, it's red hot. Red hot. In no, fact, literally. it's even red, okay? <laughs> so imagine what would happen if you, <laughs> it wasn't that good a joke. <clears throat> so imagine what would happen if you took uh, something like a fireplace poker, heated it up in the fire until it was glowing red, and then took it out and plunged it into a bucket of cold water. It would make it boil, right? So let's let that boil away. And uh, uh, while it's boiling away, let's see what else we can do. Um, uh, let's see, how about... Uh, Ah, here we go, here we go, great. A rubber band, nice stretchy rubber band, right? Okay, I'm gonna take this rubber band and plunge it into this bucket of liquid nitrogen. Now you can't see, maybe the people up top can see what's happening, but, but it's making the liquid nitrogen boil, of course, because it's so hot. Now it doesn't take long before the boiling stops. That means that the rubber band is down to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen. When I take it out, I can break it as if it were a dry twig, but all I have to do is warm it up in my hands a little bit and it's a nice stretchy rubber band again. This stuff is really, really cold. And 
you know, if you've got something that cold, then why not use it to cool down your gas? <laughs> so let's, let's cool it, because, you know, we want to make sure that we've got plenty of cold gas to, uh, uh, to do our experiments. So let's, uh, let's cool down a little bit more gas. There we go. Okay, great, great. Okay, now let's, let's see what has happened to the flour. I look in here and I see the boiling has stopped. That means the flour is now down to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen. When I pull this flour out, it is uh, frozen so hard. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. I can crush it like it was made out of glass. Thank you. This stuff, this stuff is really, really cold. And if you got something that cold, <laughs> what? <laughs> so if you got something that cold, then why not use it to cool down your gas to make the, uh, uh, the atoms and molecules move, uh, move more slowly. So let's just... Uh, Let's just stuff another, uh, uh, another balloon in there. Okay, okay, let's see what else we got here. Now, when you first learned how to do things in the kitchen, I'm sure that your parents warned you that you should never, ever, ever take a closed container of liquid and put it into the oven. Here we have a container. Here we have some liquid. Okay. Okay, I think that's enough. And now we're going to close it really, really tight. And compared to this liquid, this entire room is an oven. So let's put it in the oven and let's, I don't know, let's baste it a little bit. Okay, we'll see what happens. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. Ah, here, wait. Here is a nice, nice bouncy rubber ball. This is a regulation racket ball, okay? Nice. No, no, it's a racket ball, not a squash ball. Squash isn't nearly as... as as suitable for the purpose. I'm not, have nothing against the game of squash, but, uh, but, but at, at, for suitability for this purpose, a racquetball is what you want because it's nice and bouncy. Okay, I'm gonna put the racquetball into the liquid nitrogen and let's see what happens. In the meantime, let's, uh, let's put some more uh, gas in. <laughs> what? <laughs> Because, I mean, if we can cool down these atoms and molecules, then that means that, uh, that we're going to uh, be able to measure them better. That's the whole point. If they're moving more slowly, we can, we can measure these things better. So we're going to... Yeah, it's getting a little crowded in there, so I've got to push it in. But, you know, you just, just force it in and it'll be fine. Okay, good. Good. Now let's see. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to do? Oh yeah, let's, let's go ahead and see what has happened to our uh, racquetball. Okay, so you remember how nice and bouncy the racquetball was? It, it breaks 
it breaks like it were, as, as if it were made out of porcelain. This, uh, this stuff is really, uh, really cold. And if you've got something that cold, then, you know, why not use it? Another one. Because we got to have lots of lots of gas if we want to if, if if we want to do an experiment. So somebody said that I must be lightheaded. And the answer is of course, because light is what it's all about. Light is what I use in my lab all the time. Okay. Now, okay. So let's talk a little bit about just how cold this stuff is. In order to understand how cold liquid nitrogen is, it's helpful to think about the temperature scale that physicists use to measure temperatures. Now, uh, in ordinary life, we want to know how hot or cold it is outside. We'll use the Fahrenheit scale or the Celsius scale. If it's freezing outside, it's zero Celsius, right? Sometimes it goes below freezing. You know, it might be minus five Celsius on a cold day, even minus 15 sometimes. Well, physicists don't like these negative temperatures, and so we've developed a temperature scale called the Kelvin scale, in which the lowest possible temperature is called zero, absolute zero. Now, why is there a lowest possible temperature? Well, remember, temperature is about motion. The faster the atoms and molecules are moving, the higher the temperature. In fact, temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy, the energy of motion of the atoms and molecules that make up whatever the stuff is. So uh, the slowest you can go is stopped. And that means there's a lowest possible temperature, which is what we call absolute zero. Now, it turns out that even at absolute zero, the motion of the atoms and molecules doesn't really stop. It has to do with quantum mechanics and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But let's just say that between us friends, that absolute zero is when the motion stops. Measuring up from absolute zero, room temperature, where we are here, is about 300 degrees. Those degrees are Celsius degrees above absolute zero. So we say 300 Kelvin, that's about room temperature. Ice melts at about 273 Kelvin. Dry ice, pretty cold stuff, right? 195 Kelvin. The coldest place ever measured on the surface of the Earth in Antarctica in the winter at a Russian research station, 185 degrees. In other words, 10 degrees colder than dry ice in Antarctica in the winter, 185 degrees. So that's the coldest temperature on Earth. This stuff, my friends, which unless you have been in a low temperature physics laboratory, I'm pretty sure this is the coldest stuff you've ever seen. I mean, after all, it boils when you pour it out. Oh dear, it's empty. Fortunately, I've got more. <laughs> yeah. Boils when you pour it out on the floor. It's just amazing. I mean, this, this, this stuff is just so wonderful. The temperature of this, remember, coldest place on the earth, 185 Kelvin. This stuff is 77 Kelvin. 77 Kelvin, the coldest stuff you've ever seen. And so it seems perfectly reasonable that we would use it to uh, cool down our gas the only trouble was that I think some of you may have noticed that uh, there was something a little bit funny going on here, that uh, uh, it seemed like the volume of the balloons that went into this bucket was considerably bigger than the volume of the bucket. And the reason is that these balloons have turned into... Oh! Oh, fantastic! Fantastic, that's great. <laughs> so people, people, your, your mother was right. Don't ever put a closed container of liquid into the oven. Okay, don't ever do that. 
Now, let me just take a few moments to talk about safety. Because you see me doing all this stuff here, right? You see me doing all this stuff. And, uh, and you think, wow, that's really cool. I'd like to do that. And I'm glad. That's a great reaction. I want you to want to do this. But what you need to do is to study science and then get the safety training to know how to handle a material like this. I have done all kinds of things that you may not have noticed uh, to make sure that I'm safe and that you're safe. Uh, I took my watch off so to prevent the possibility that any of the liquid nitrogen would get caught by my watch and give me frostbite. I, well, usually I wear my jacket at the beginning, but I'd already taken it off because my bare arms are a lot more safe than uh, a wool jacket that, where the liquid nitrogen could soak in and, and hurt me. The kind of shoes that I wear, the eye protection, all is part of the safety process, the way I hold the containers when I'm pouring the liquid nitrogen. You need safety training in order to be able to work with, uh, with this kind of a material. But let's go back to the balloons. The reason why I was able to put all those balloons in there is because these balloons are as flat as pancakes. These are like Frisbees. Okay, now, wait a minute, okay, how many, how many, <laughs> how many balloons, who knows how many balloons I put in? Six, six, right, three of each, right? Three blue ones, okay, come on now, what are we? I mean, you're not in junior high school, come on. <laughs> okay, so I put in six balloons, and three of them were gold, and three of them were blue, right? Right? Okay, how many, how many green balloons did I put in? What about red ones? How about, uh, how about another green one? What about purple? What about orange? Well, here's another orange. Uh, red, orange. Okay, let's go back to the lighting. <laughs> let's go back, let's go back to the stage lighting, okay. So, look, those balloons became flat not because the air went out of them, because you can see, obviously, the people who are throwing them around the auditorium, they, uh, they, they reinflated once they warmed up. So what happened was that the, the, the gas that was in the balloon condensed into a liquid or a solid. And this is what always happens if you have a gas of anything and you put it in contact with a cold enough refrigerator, the gas will condense into a liquid or a solid and you won't have a gas anymore. And that's bad because if we want to make an atomic clock, we want these atoms to be floating freely in space. We don't want them to be stuck on to other atoms or stuck on to a container uh, because that will alter the ticking frequency. So we have to have these atoms floating freely in space and that means that we cannot cool them this way. If we, if we cool any gas by taking, putting them in a container and and cooling the container, it will condense or it'll stick to the walls of the container. We won't have a gas and it won't work. So this isn't gonna work. There's another problem. This is really cold, right? 77 degrees. The, the velocity, and we wanna make these things go really slow. So the velocity goes like the square of the temperature. So that means that, um, uh, like the square root of the temperature, I'm sorry. The, the velocity goes like, like, like the, uh, uh, the square of the velocity goes like the temperature. So that means the velocity goes like the square root of the temperature. So when I go to 77 degrees compared to 300, it's about a factor of four in temperature. So that's a factor of two in velocity. So that means that this, uh, uh, this liquid nitrogen, when I pour this liquid nitrogen out on the ground and it vaporizes and turns into a gas, that gas uh, is coming off with velocity of about, of about 150 meters per second, about half as fast as the nitrogen molecules in the air. 
Well, a factor of two isn't bad, but I have not spent more than 40 years of my life trying to make half-fast atoms. What I wanted to do <laughs> was to make atoms that were really, really cold. And so we need another method. And that method has been staring at us from the heavens for centuries, because since the time of Kepler, people have known that the tails of comets always point away from the sun. And the reason is that the sunlight pushes on the dust that is part of the comet and pushes the dust in the direction away from the sun. So when a comet comes in from the outer reaches of the solar system, the tail stream is behind it. And when it comes around and goes back out, the tail streams in front of it. And people have known for centuries that this is true. And uh, as a result, uh, uh, Kepler guessed that, uh, that the light was pushing on, on the dust, and he was right. And what we're going to do is we're going to use laser light to push on our atoms to slow down the atoms, and if we slow them down, that means that we're cooling them. Now, it sounds crazy. We shine light on something, and it gets cold. Usually when you shine light on something, it gets warm. But we're going to shine light on something, and it's going to get cold, and I don't have time to tell you how it works, but ask me about it later. And we get it really, really cold. Here is a picture from our laboratory. Why don't we make it a little bit darker on the stage that shows laser beams coming in from every direction. And here is a ball about a centimeter across. And inside there are sodium atoms. And those sodium atoms should be, according to the theory, should be as cold as 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. Well, are they? It turns out, and this is crazy, they're even colder. We discovered in 1988 that the temperature was much colder than was predicted. This is a violation of Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law says that whatever can go wrong will. Well, we were trying to make it as cold as we could, and we got it colder. It was amazing, and nobody understood why. Uh, we, were, we were totally uh, baffled. We had seen something that is the scientific equivalent of a snowball in hell, something far, far colder than what uh, we expected. Uh, the theorists went crazy trying to think of what was going on, and eventually the best of these theorists, Claude cohen Tanuji and Jean Dalibar in Paris, Steve Chu in Stanford, figured out what was going on, and guided by their new understanding, we were able to get the temperature of our atoms, of cesium atoms. Remember, cesium is the thing we use for clocks. 200 times colder than what the theory had originally anticipated by uh, understanding the new theory. Those cesium atoms are, instead of moving at 100, a couple hundred meters per second, they're only moving at a centimeter per second. And so, our scientists out in Boulder, Colorado, are now making atomic clocks. This is called an atomic fountain clock, and I'll show you why in a moment. What they do is they cool down cesium atoms. This is Don Meekhoff and Steve Jefferts, and they cool down cesium atoms here. And then they take the cesium atoms and they toss them up in the vacuum about a meter high. And if you toss something up about a meter, it comes back down after about a second. So the light makes it easy for you to see, but boy, it makes it hard for me to see. <laughs> and so uh, it's sort of like these, these water jet fountains that you see. Uh, oh, I guess I don't have a picture of the water jet fountain, but it doesn't matter. These clocks are now a hundred times better than the clocks that used fast atoms. These clocks are good to a part in 10 to the 16, which is one second in 300 million years. Now that's great. Uh, throw them up, they come back down after a second, but what if we want to keep the atoms longer than a second? Well, if we want to keep them longer than a second, we're going to have to trap them somehow. We have, have to put them in some sort of a container, and what we are going to do is I'm going to show you how that works. We can't put our atoms in any ordinary container. If the container was cold, then it would uh, make the atoms just stick to it. If the container is hot, it would heat the atoms up. So we have to use a container that doesn't have any materials in it. So let's have a little bit, whatever you think is the right lighting level to do this experiment. It turns out, oh, let's, yeah, it turns out all of you have played with magnets, right? Well, it turns out that our atoms are like little tiny magnets. 
Did you ever try to arrange magnets on a table and then try to make one magnet float above the other magnets? Yeah. Well, that's what I've got here. I've got a big magnet here. I've got a little magnet here that represents our atoms. And this uh, uh, big magnet is pushing up on the little magnet enough so that it should float when it's sitting right here. And if I let it go, what happens is it doesn't float. It flips over and gets attracted to the big magnet. And that's what always happens when you try to do this with ordinary magnets. But you learn something else playing with toys as children, and that is that if you spin a top, it doesn't fall over. And it turns out that our atoms are not just little tiny magnets, they're little tiny spinning magnets. So we're gonna spin this top, and now we're gonna lift it to the place where uh, the magnetic field pushes up to keep it floating, and there it floats. But any, any two-bit magician can levitate a woman and then pass a ring around her, carefully avoiding the, the wires or the supports that are holding her up, but you never see a magician do that. You see, this is the real thing. This is really floating, and that's what we do with our atoms. Thank you. Okay, so now let's go back to Let's go back to the PowerPoint and let's, this, that was, no, let, let's have it dark because the next thing is the dark movie. Good, that's great. So here is a movie of actual atoms being trapped in a magnetic trap similar to the one that you've just seen in the toy version. So here's the atoms. That's a ball of cesium atoms about two millimeters across, cooled to a temperature of about a millionth of a degree and these atoms are bouncing back and forth, and you see they, they go away after a little while because the vacuum isn't perfect. So after a little while, the background gas atoms in this really good vacuum eventually hit our cold atoms and knock them out. Now, we've made the, the, the vacuum better, and now people are trapping atoms not just in magnetic traps, but in laser traps and in ion traps that use that use electric fields to trap atoms. And my colleague, Jun Yi, at our uh, laboratories in Boulder, has taken neutral strontium atoms and made a, an atomic clock ticking not at nine billion cycles per second, but at, at uh, several times 10 to the 14 cycles per second. And this clock is good to two parts in 10 to the 18. In other words, it's almost four orders of magnitude better than the laser, the, 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 uh, the clocks that weren't laser cooled. Uh, Dave Wineland traps a single aluminum ion and gets it down so that its accuracy is nine times 10 to the minus 19. This is less than one second in the age of the universe, 10 to the minus 19. At the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where Dave Wineland works and where I work, an agency of the United States government, this is what we call close enough for government work. <laughs> so now we're coming to, to the end of a kind of an odyssey. We can have the lights up now in which we are, have been searching for colder and colder temperatures. And I've illustrated that odyssey here on this cartoon of a thermometer that has a logarithmic scale. By a logarithmic scale, what I mean is each tick mark on here represents a factor of 10 change in the temperature. The top of this is the surface of the sun, about 6,000 degrees. Now that's not the hottest temperature there is in the universe, but it's pretty hot, right? On this scale, room temperature is just a little bit cooler than the surface of the sun. And liquid nitrogen, 77 degrees, is only a little bit cooler than that. And even outer space, if you go far away from any stars or planets, it'll be three degrees the, from the radiation left over from the Big Bang almost 14 billion years ago. That's the temperature of outer space, the coldest natural temperature in the universe. So when I say our stuff, is the coolest stuff in the universe, I really mean it. Because in those first experiments, it was supposed to be 240 microkelvin. That's colder compared to outer space than outer space is compared to the surface of the sun. And that was just the beginning. 
with, with the, the new kind of cooling that we learned how to do down to temperatures just a little bit above one micro degree. And that was just the beginning. I haven't told you about Bose-Einstein condensation, one of the cool things, one of the things that brought me here to Pittsburgh was a conference about that. And uh, the first time that was done, got down to 50 nanokelvin, that's 51 billionths of a degree. But that was only the beginning. Uh, by 2003, they'd gotten down to one half of one billionth of a degree above absolute zero. And now we have experiments in the International Space Station where we're hoping to get down to temperatures as low as one picokelvin, that is one less than one trillionth of a degree above absolute zero. And what do we do with all these things? Well, today, every uh, big industrialized country uses laser-cooled clocks to define time for their country and for the entire world. And these clocks are being used to test fundamental theories of nature, to do things like make quantum computers. And I wish I had time to tell you about quantum computers. It's so exciting. But perhaps the thing that's most exciting is the things we haven't thought of yet the things that maybe some of you, if you become uh, scientists and join a research group like the one that I'm so privileged to work in, and here are uh, my, uh, my colleagues, Trey Porto and Ian Spielman, uh, Gretchen Campbell and Paul Lett, the people I work with every day, and you may become a part of that group where people from all over the world, from China, from Mexico, from France and Germany, have come together to try to uh, explore the most interesting uh, mysteries of the universe. And so we come to the end, but it's not the end because there's always something new to learn. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.